August is a strange time in the Apple calendar. Because Apple has a pattern of product releases and announcements every year, we can pretty much predict what will be coming out soon and what you should absolutely not be buying right now. So in this video, we'll be going through exactly what you should avoid like the plague and what you can probably get away with buying even though we are expecting new hardware in the next few months. I'm David from Living on iPad and I break down the Apple ecosystem so it just works for you. If you love Apple products then hit that like button and subscribe for more videos to make your Apple life more simple. Every June Apple holds the WWDC, that's the Worldwide Developers Conference and each year they will show off what is coming next to iOS, to watchOS, iPadOS, macOS and the rest of their software platforms as new platforms are released year by year. Now this year in 2020 Apple made huge announcements about Apple Silicon coming to their Macs which will replace over the current two years all of their Intel chips that they're currently using. Now that means that Apple is completely overhauling its software and the new chips are going to be very much based on what we currently have in the iPads, the iPhones, Apple TV and the rest of Apple's ecosystem. Apple Silicon is a huge deal because Apple's own processors that they've been putting into our iPhones and our iPads for years have been incredibly powerful in comparison when you look at the power draw that they take compared to an Intel chip. So following WWDC each June, uh, September, Apple announces their iPhones and basically releases all of their new software platforms in September. There'll be beta releases that are available throughout the year for people to test. First of all, a developer beta and then followed by the public betas, both of which are now available. So if you want to play around with the newest software, you can do that. But in September, that's when the new hardware arrives for iPhones and the official releases of the software happens. Apple hasn't been able to do regular updates to Mac hardware in the same way that has uh, with their annual updates to the iPhones, because in the past they've been waiting around for Intel and their other chip manufacturers to release the chips that they need to make those platforms uh, viable. However, moving over to Apple Silicon, as I've said already, they will have end-to-end -end control of everything in the same way that they do for the iPhones and the iPads, so they will more than likely be able to do a single annual refresh to all of their platforms. It's already been announced though that this year Apple Silicon Macs will be landing. The first Apple Silicon Macs will arrive before the end of 2020. That means, although they're doing a two-year rollout and a two-year transition over to Apple Silicon from the Intel platform that they're on now, going forward, after that two years, everything is going to be about Apple Silicon. And that, to me, makes the Intel Macs a very bad buy at this point. Apple also has, from time to time, held a late October event, which would introduce other hardware, things like more iPads, I believe, uh, Several of the iPads have been introduced at October events after the main iPhone events, purely because they have so much to announce at those September events. And they've also held March events in the past for iPad, especially when they brought in the first low cost iPad that had Apple Pencil support. And this was primarily for education market. We don't know exactly which Macs are gonna be out at what point throughout the year, but right now, what should you buy from Apple and what should you absolutely avoid? Right now, I think you would be absolutely crazy to buy a Mac. Now, Apple yesterday released a brand new iMac update. It goes up to a 10-core Intel Comet Lake processor. It allows up to 128 gig gigabytes of RAM, and it has pretty much uh, got rid completely of spinning hard drives. Now, you can still spec out an iMac with a Fusion drive, which is a small SSD paired with a platter hard drive, but I would absolutely not recommend that. Definitely go down the SSD route, which they now come with as standard. However, I wouldn't be buying an Intel Mac at all at this point until we see the Apple Silicon Macs actually land, be able to see what they're gonna look like in comparison to the Intels in terms of performance. As far as we know so far, all of the developers that are using the software developer kit are absolutely raving about it. They're saying that the performance is incredible. This is using the A12Z chip, which is currently in the iPad Pro it's not designed for a desktop use but they're already finding brilliant performance on these and even with 
Intel based software that's running through Rosetta and Universal. They're finding that the performance is even better on Apple Silicon than it would be on a native Intel chip and that is incredible. So right now until uh, Apple Silicon Macs are released I would absolutely not recommend to anyone to even buy that brand new iMac that was released yesterday. What else should you not buy? iPhones. We know pretty much like clockwork that Apple will be releasing new iPhones in September or at least towards the end of September and the beginning of October. Now we're already into August at this point when I'm uh, producing this video so iPhones are not far away. The only iPhone that I would currently recommend anyone even consider is the iPhone SE and we'll come to why very very soon. I also wouldn't recommend that anyone picks up an iPad at this point. This channel is called Living on iPad and the iPad is a great piece of kit. However, right now, until we know exactly what's going to be coming out in September and October, I absolutely wouldn't recommend that anyone buys a brand new iPad. So what can you buy right now? So for me, I would be looking at the iPhone SE, as I've mentioned. The iPhone SE was released only a few months ago. It uses the latest A13 chip, uh, which is exactly what you would find in iPhone uh, 11 or an 11 Pro. It is a top of the line chip. It comes in at $400 or 420 pounds here in the UK, and it is an absolute powerhouse of a phone for a very, very low price point. The compromises that you get, it uses an LCD screen and it is the uh, 16 by nine screens that we used to have on the iPhones before we got to the modern design language with the notch and the edge to edge screens. It doesn't have face ID, it uses touch ID. That's fine, especially at the moment, touch ID is actually preferable uh, because when you're out and about and you're wearing a mask, face ID is really difficult uh, and Apple's even updated their software to make the passcode come up instantly when, you, uh, when it detects a mask because they know that people are gonna be struggling to unlock these with a face mask on. So touch ID is a really useful feature right now. The A13 chip will have longevity. It's not gonna be something that stops working very soon. I said when the iPhone SE came out, and this is the 2020 SE we're talking about, the original SE was based on the iPhone uh, 5S chassis. So it was a very, very small phone, uh, which was the first phone that had touch ID. It came out quite a while ago. So I think the, the 2020 iPhone SE is a decent buy at this point. I do think if you can save for it, I would probably recommend going for an iPhone 12 when they come out. It looks like there's going to be a very small handset, uh, which will be obviously using an A14 chip. Uh, there's going to be two iPhone 12s, two iPhone 12 Pros, so we are going to have a lot of choices once iPhones hit this year. So bear that in mind, um, but the iPhone SE is still a solid buy at this point. Other things that I think uh, are a decent buy at this point, an Apple TV, there are rumours of an updated Apple TV coming out, however, at this point, it's... It performs absolutely perfectly. If you've got an HDTV, they're about 150 pounds, I think. If you need a 4K, they're 199, I believe. Could be wrong on those. I will fix it on the screen if I got it wrong. Gaming on the Apple TV is pretty good using the included remote. For the majority of what people use an Apple TV for, it's for consuming content, and they are all absolutely fine for that. There's no issues with slowdowns or anything along those lines. What else is worth buying right now? AirPods or AirPods Pro. They are great devices. Um, I love my AirPods to bits. If you've not seen, I wrote an article recently and I will turn it into a video very soon on the fact that I managed to wash my AirPods through the laundry and put them through the dryer by accident. I didn't do this on purpose for a piece of content. I did all of that and they survived. Somehow they still work. They're a little bit warped. <laughs> I would have to say, um, in terms of their actual physical appearance. However, they are still working. The AirPods and the AirPods Pro are also getting software updates in September, but they will work with the current hardware that's out there. So the AirPods uh, in general will automatically switch between your Apple devices as you're using them. So when you move from using your iPhone to listen to a podcast or making a call uh, to watching a video on your iPad, they will automatically switch if you're still wearing them or again to your Mac if you're doing some content creation. Um, also, the AirPods Pro will be getting spatial audio and the spatial audio looks absolutely magical. So not only will it create 
fully 360 sound around your head. This was all put out at the WWDC. It will create these virtual speakers around your head, which will stay in place if you move your head. There are ac accelerometers in the headphones, which basically mean they know where your head's moving and the virtual speakers will stay static in space even as you move your head. But if you're watching on an iPad or an iPhone and you move that around, that will essentially be the virtual source of the sound. So this virtual sound will be coming from your, <laughs> from your iPhone or your iPad. I don't understand the magic that Apple is doing with these devices, but it sounds fabulous. Yes, they're expensive, but the cheap knockoff Bluetooth looks like AirPods but isn't stuff. You do lose a lot of the convenience, you lose a lot of the magic of how they work. Just being able to open the case and them automatically pairing with your phone is just really, really nice. Um, being able to see individual battery levels within the iOS widgets that will be coming with iOS 14 as well, very, very cool, very useful to be able to keep track on your battery levels and things like that. The last thing that I would recommend is if you already have a Mac and you want to keep it running a little bit longer, maybe because you want to see whether the Apple Silicon is going to work for you or not, is upgrades. So if you've got an iMac, like my 27 inch iMac right here, you are able to upgrade the RAM yourself. You are able to do that quite easily. The 21 inch Macs, uh, iMacs are very difficult to upgrade. If you're using a spinning hard drive at the moment, if you're using a physical hard disk, I don't recommend that that is the way that you do it. This uh, originally came with a one terabyte hard drive, spinning hard drive inside. I haven't opened it up, but I am running it from an SSD now. And because the USB ports on the back are so fast, the USB 3 ports, I've actually got an SSD attached to the back of the iMac, uh, which is literally just held on by a cable tie. That is where my operating system lives. So I boot off of an external hard drive every day. That's where all of my uh, software, my apps and everything lives. And then the internal hard drive is now a storage disk. And I've also got a boot camp partition and things like that on there. Speaking of bootcamp, one of the big uh, downsides for some people with Apple Silicon is that bootcamp is no longer going to be an option for anyone. So you will not be able to boot, uh, dual boot your Mac into Windows as well as Mac OS. So that can be a massive deal breaker for some people. And especially if you need to use Windows software for some productivity stuff, stuff that's not available for Mac at the moment, uh, your options will be either buying an Intel Mac or virtualization. So you can run something like Parallels potentially uh, within your Apple Silicon Mac. That's not confirmed at the moment because obviously Apple Silicon Macs aren't here yet and Big Sur is not in broad release, but that is likely to be your main option if you are running an Apple Silicon Mac. The big advantages, of course, of running the Apple Silicon Macs is that although you won't be able to run Windows software, you will natively be able to run pretty much every iPhone and every iPad app that have already been created in the App Store, which massively blows open the amount of software that is available for your Mac, uh, just purely by the fact that you will be able to run all of this software that's out there already. Mac Catalyst, which is uh, a piece of software that Apple brought out a year ago, um, is essentially a way of translating uh, iPad apps to be able to run on an Intel Mac like this, but that has to be done by the developers. Once Apple Silicon Macs arrive, they will natively be able to run iPhone and iPad apps unless the developer has decided that they shouldn't be able to. And also with Universal, there will be a single binary. Once you buy your app in one place, you will be able to install it everywhere that you were able to use it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of why I think you should be waiting. With Apple Silicon Macs, the ones that we are pretty confident are going to be on their way before the end of this year are the MacBook itself, which is the entry level. We think that's going to be at $7.99, although there are now rumors that that could be an education price. And the 13-inch MacBook Pro, which is looking at being about $10.99. These two are the ones that we've had links for, and there are videos which I have linked up here somewhere or up here, depending on which side the cards come up. So those are a couple of the Macs that we're expecting. There's also pretty solid rumors of a 24 inch iMac, uh, which I believe will replace the 21 inch iMac because that got very little love in the 27 inch iMac update that came out a few days ago. I think that that one will probably be here by the end of the year, but it might be it might be announced and not released until the new year. We will have to see on that one and we'll have to see what the, the displays are like and things like that, because at the moment, the 27 inch iMac rocks a, a, a 5K display. 
the 21 inch iMac works a 4k display I can't imagine they'll just bring that up and keep it at 4k so maybe they're going to shrink a 5k into it or maybe they're all going to go to 6k like the XDR displays that Apple's released there is so much that we don't know at this point um, that's why I can't really recommend to anyone to buy a Mac unless you absolutely have to run Windows software in which case grab yourself an Intel Mac at the moment but the other thing is if when these Apple Silicon Macs come out, they don't perform the way that we expected. You're still going to be able to buy an Intel Mac because they're still going to exist. They're still going to be there on the secondary market and you will be able to pick them up. So you're not going to miss out by waiting. But if you can hang on a little bit longer, it's probably going to pay dividends for most people. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Is there an Apple device that I've completely missed out? Is there a peripheral that you think is a really good add-on for your Mac setup? If there is, hit me up in the comments below. As I said at the beginning of this video, I am trying to improve our audio and our lighting. And I think from the last couple of videos that I've put out, we might have pretty much got there now. But please let me know in the comments how this sounds, how it looks to you. And I will see you on the next video. Thank you so much for joining me.